Verstanden. So. <laughs> Dr. White um, joined the Institute for Government in May 2014. Uh, is now Deputy Director of the Institute for Government and leads the Institute for Government's work on Parliament in the UK. Institute for Government is, and I had to, had to resort to Wikipedia for this, <laughs> the leading UK think tank working to make government more effective. It is a registered charity focusing on advancement of education in the art and science of government, and promotion of efficient public administration and public service in the UK. I expect um, Dr. White or Hannah will give us further and deeper insights into the Institute for Government in the course of her talk. Dr. White or Hannah has more than 10 years of direct experience in Parliament and the civil service and is a recognised authority on Westminster and Whitehall. In 2020, Hannah received an OBE for services to the constitution. Hannah is a regular commentator for radio and TV, making frequent contributions to, amongst others, Radio 4, Newsnight, BBC News and Sky News. Hannah also writes for, amongst others, The Guardian, The Times and The Telegraph. And next spring, Hannah's book, Held in Contempt, What's Wrong with the House of Commons, is due to be published by Manchester University Press. So keep your eyes open for that. So without further ado, let me hand over to you, Hannah. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, can, I, can I check you're expecting me to speak for about sort of 40, 45 minutes and then have questions? 45, 50, and then question and answer. That's fine, yeah? Fine. Absolutely, yeah, Perfect. very good. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, well. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to speak to you all. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening. I'm only sorry that I can't be with you in person. As you said, Nick, it would be much more congenial to be uh, in, in the same room and able to see your faces, but thank you for all keeping your cameras on so I can feel like I'm actually talking to an audience rather than uh, just a series of blank screens. Um, as you said, the Institute for Government is, is a non-partisan think tank uh, in the UK, we're, we're not aligned with any political party. And we're pretty unusual actually when it comes to think tanks because we don't work on government policy, we work on the workings of government itself and how government can work more effectively. You can understand this if you know that we were set up by uh, David Sainsbury of the Sainsbury family supermarket, of uh, who owned the supermarket, who was uh, in a previous role had been finance director of Sainsbury's <clears throat> and then was asked to become a science minister uh, by Gordon Brown, the prime minister. And when he went into government as a minister, a uh, member of the House of Lords, he was appalled by the fact that government was not run as effectively as a supermarket. And so when he came out of government, he wanted to set up an institute whose job it would be to think about the nuts and bolts of how government is run and to just make everything more effective. Unfortunately, this normally, um, when we tell people our mission is to make government more effective, in the cynical uh, way that uh, the, the UK public normally think about government, that normally elicits gales of laughter from people. They normally say things like, well, you, you, know, you have a lot to do and uh, you still, still have a lot of work to do, um, but that's our, our job. And as you said, Nick, my role at the Institute initially, uh, having worked in the House of Commons, was to uh, think about the role of Parliament in making government more effective. Um, and uh, just lately, I've been reflecting on uh, how the Constitution, and obviously Parliament is a, a large part of that, has been operating in the UK in the last few years, both during uh, bre the Brexit period and uh, more lately in relation to coronavirus. And this is what I want to talk to you all about today. Um, so my theme that I am um, planning to, to, to talk about is really about the significance of time pressure uh, for the way that the UK Constitution operates. And as you will all know, the UK Constitution is famous for being unwritten, um, unlike many, indeed most constitutions, including the German Constitution. Um, in fact, 
it is actually written down in lots of places. It's written down in laws. It's written down in what we call the cabinet manual. It's written down in the rules of parliament and so on. But it's not codified. It's more accurate to say it's an uncodified constitution because nobody has brought all the different elements of it together in one place um, in a way that's sort of accessible and easy to understand. And this uncodified nature of the, of the British constitution presents particular challenges, some advantages, people would also say, but today I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and risks to the UK con uh, constitution, which I think uh, have uh, manifest uh, in the past few years. Um, as I say, today I'm going to talk about the UK experience of Brexit and of coronavirus um, and ask what effect these two crises have had on the UK's constitution. But I, I'm hoping that you will find as you listen to me that there may be parallels or indeed contrasts with um, experience in, in Germany or Austria, wherever you happen to be. Um, and that um, I, I would be really interested in, in questions to hear about your own reflections um, on what, what sort of resonates and, and what um, seems relevant to, to your context as well as uh, the UK context. So to begin with, um, I want to just reflect a little bit on time and the constitution and how these two things interact. Time is a really crucial thing, actually, in the operation of any constitution, because it governs uh, pract the practices of the institutions of the, of the state, so parliament, government, the judiciary, but it also governs relationships between them. So to take some examples, the UK's parliamentary procedures and practices are full of, uh, the UK, uh, full of references to time. So there are things like, deadlines for tabling amendments to bills. There are what we call, uh, in a colourful way, guillotines on the length of debates. So times when you have to stop debating certain subjects. We have allocations of days to, that you can spend doing different sorts of business in Parliament. So at a day-to-day -day level, we have lots of rules which, which govern how Parliament itself works. And lots of those are designed to make sure that Parliament can get through the government's business that you can't have filibustering, you can't have um, people delaying things to prevent uh, the government getting its business done in Parliament. Then we have, if you look at another institution in the Constitution, you have the government, and its working is also uh, very much determined by timeframes. So at the moment, we have something called the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, uh, which determines that uh, there has to be five years between every general election, unless a certain set of uh, other things uh, other things happen. The government is actually in the process of repealing that law, um, but it does intend to replace it with uh, a, a fi another five-year time limit between elections, but it's just changing it so that it, it's going to restore to itself uh, the power to choose when elections should happen. Then we can see, as well as governing time, uh, the, the way in which institutions uh, operate, time also shapes the relationship between different branches of the constitution. So um, in between uh, elections, the way in which government legislates and passes laws is normally disciplined by the convention of an annual cycle of parliament, what we call parliamentary sessions. So a one year session a cycle in which the government would normally pass one batch of legislation. And that is the normal state of affairs actually in the UK for different reasons, um, including Brexit recently, we've had some, both some very long sessions um, lasting over two years and some very and a very short one we had in, in the autumn of 2019, we had a session which only lasted technically for 15 days. So it's, a, it's normally uh, about a year. And the reason to have parliamentary sessions is to help government shape its sort of lawmaking process. So as you get to the end of each session, uh, you get to sort of a little bit of time pressure at the end of the year, which helps drive consensus between political parties. So they can say, well, okay, these are the laws which we're going to finally pass in this session, and then we'll move on to a new batch um, in the next session. Then, of course, there are ways in which time shapes the processes of government and its interaction with parliament over much shorter timeframes, so much less than a year. So, for example, we have 
um, time limits on how quickly government must answer questions which come from MPs and peers in the House of Lords. And, you know, who knows, if you didn't have those time limits, how long government would actually take before it got round to answering those questions. And we also have rules about how quickly, when a parliamentary committee writes a report, how quickly government has to respond to that report. And again, you know, we have a convention, it should do so within 60 days, so that the scrutiny committee can get a response from government to what it's recommended. But um, in fact, you know, the government is already not very good at sticking to the 60 day limit. And I dread to think if you didn't have the 60 day limit, how long it would um, actually take to respond to lots of what parliament says to it. Just as I think all these conventions and rules can be construct, uh, 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 which are based on sort of time, can be constructive and necessary. I also think that the, op the, uh, the, the, um, the opposite is true in the sense that um, an absence of time constraints can create problems for the operation of government. So the most obvious example of this, I think, is, is public inquiries. Um, and if you take, say, the example of the uh, what was known colloquially as the, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry, which looked into the deaths of uh, civilians during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, that lasted for 12 years. Um, and that's because there's no limit in the UK on how long public inquiries can go on for. In contrast to inquests, inquests into um, uh, deaths for which there is a, an unclear explanation, um, those have to, there's a sort of informal limit that those have to be concluded within a year. And I think that the trouble with public inquiries is because they can just go on for as long as, uh, you know, how long is a piece of string, the people who are looking for some kind of resolution and learning from those inquiries can feel 